greetings everybody. Today is November 7th, 2024. Uh, we've got a couple more months before someone is selected for the office of President of the United States. Somebody that has vowed to stamp out the scourge of anti-Semitism. And uh, I went to Google and uh, typed in, who's the most evil anti-Semite that ever lived? I was hoping AI would give me their version of it, but no, they wouldn't do that. No, they mentioned uh, Henry Ford and uh, Louis Farrakhan and a few others. But uh, according to the you-know-whos, they say that the most evil anti-Semite that ever lived uh, lived about 2,000 years ago and uh, claimed to have died for our sins and what has risen from the grave. Yeah. So, the uh, thing is, you better believe that all those the so-called right-wingers are going to support this individual in the stamping out of anti-Semitism. But uh, <laughs> I guess they don't fully understand uh, the full implication of it. Look in the into the Noahide laws, N-O-A-H-I-D-E. Uh, I've been warning about those for about 20 years now, believe it or not. And uh, all Christians are considered idolaters. Uh, if you read the Bible, you will not find where Noah was given any laws by the Lord. Nope, it's not in there. It only exists in the minds of the Antichrists that uh, deny Jesus. And that's what makes them Antichrist. So, yeah. Uh, but... According to the Noahide laws, all Christians that believe Jesus is God in the flesh are idolaters. Penalty is death. Method of execution is beheading. And uh, so where is beheading in the Bible? Let's take a look. Oh, here's a good one. Um Romans 8.18, and this Bible study is going to be on uh, Paul and tongues, because somebody said that Paul was the creator of the Pentecostal church and speaking gibberish, and, and no, no, that's not what Paul was talking about when he talked about tongues, but we're going to go into that more later. All right, Romans 8.18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And, of course, this is talking about the future. So, uh, beheaded. That is in uh, Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4. Don't tell this to the pre-trippers because they don't believe this. There is a whole bunch of the Bible that they do not believe. John, St. John, not John the Baptist, St. John. Oh, and by the way, he was uh, banished to the Isle of Patmos. According to legend, they tried to kill him and they couldn't do it. I don't know how true that is. That's not in the Bible. But, you know, they killed everybody else. They killed Peter. They killed Stephen. They killed James. Uh, Paul. Yeah, Paul died for the faith. But he's a false apostle, they'll tell you. Some. Yeah. Yeah, Paul died for the, for the faith of Jesus Christ. But he's a false apostle. Right. John wrote in the book of Revelation, chapter 20 and verse 4. 
And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. Who's he talking about here? The apostles. The apostles are going to judge the 12 tribes. Do you know the, the, the gate, the New Jerusalem gate has 12 gates? Three on the north, three on the south, three on the east, three on the west. You know why that is? 12 tribes of Israel. There is no 13th Gentile gate. And they're not going to be climbing up on the wall to go get inside another way. No. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God. Jesus and the word of God. The witness of Jesus and the word of God. Not Rabbi Menachem Schneerson of the Noahide law fame. No. And which have not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Reigned as in ruling and reigning, not water falling from the sky. Method of execution under the Noahide laws, beheading. And idiots think, uh, I call it Trump derangement syndrome. Of course, I stole that from somebody else. I don't know who, but... Yeah, but you know what? If you go to 100 Bible sites, chances are one, maybe two, uh, maybe three or four out of 100 might be all right, which means that 96, 97, 98, or 99 out of 100 are probably working for the enemy and teach lies. So... Let's take a look at tongues. We covered a little bit of that um, yesterday. But let's go take a look. What Did Paul create the Pentecostal church that was slithering on the floor speaking gibberish that nobody could understand? I don't think so, but I don't know. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. Now, I've mentioned it before, but wind and spirit comes from the same Greek word, root word, pneuma, which is where they get the word pneumatic tools, air tools. Uh, tire shops use air tools. You ever hear those when they're putting the tires on? Real, real. Well, that's air tools. Because you don't want to be using, you don't want extension cords all over the place. Especially if you're in a water environment. They use air tools. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, the Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, what are these tongues? Is it blah, 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 or is it something else? It's something else. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven, now, when this was noise abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. What do you use your tongue for? Eating and speaking. Language. Verse 7, And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue? Our own tongue. They're not speaking blah, 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 gibberish. 
No, they're hearing them in their own language. And now here, we every man in our own tongue, wherein we were born, Parthians and Medes. Uh, Medes is where uh, Parthians and Medes are in the area of modern-day Iran. And Elamites and the dwellers of Mesopotamia, which is our modern-day Iraq. And in Judea and Cappadocia and in Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia in Egypt and in parts of Libya around Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. People, this is tongues were languages and that is why the Holy Spirit rested upon the apostles so that they could speak to the people in their own language. And it's funny how the Catholic Church wanted to have people murdered for being able to read the Bible in their own language. Yeah. Believe it or not, they did. They used to burn people at the stake if they caught them with a Bible. Case in point, William Tyndale, T-Y-N-D-A-L-E, he was burned at the stake in the year 1536 for daring to make sure the Bible was translated into English and it was the first Bible in English to be actually be printed. And the King James Bible, uh, they used a lot of Tyndale's work for the uh, King James Bible. And they killed, the, the, the Vatican had Tyndale murdered because they didn't want him to give the people the Bible in their own language. I mean, really? I would not want to be those people on Judgment Day. Of course, they're probably in hell right now. And they've probably been in hell for, oh, I don't know, over 400 years. Yeah. Yeah. When they say there's going to be hell to pay, there's going to be hell to pay. I mean, these people, they think just because God lets them get away with the stuff on the earth now, that they're going to escape punishment. Boy, they got another thing coming. And I'm not talking about Judas Priest. So, no. I mean, where does Jesus say, uh, if any printeth the Bible in the common language, thou shalt put him to death. Where does that, where's that in the Bible? It's not. So, all right, let's take a look at some things. All right, let's go to the book of John, chapter 19. Do you realize that this is going to be illegal soon? What I'm reading you? I'm serious. I would, if you see a used bookshop, I'd go there and I'd buy Bibles, King James Bibles. Seriously, people, put them away, you know. Um, you never know. I, You know, throw a couple of them up in the attic of your house. So even if you're taken away, somebody else might find it one day. Or I've heard of people putting them inside walls and what have you. Um, it's going to be illegal. People don't realize it. I wonder if this is going to be the last presidential election we ever see. I don't know. Uh, Trump says it will be. All right, so. Uh, John 19, Jesus has been arrested, given this fake trial by the you-know-whos, and he has been delivered to Pilate. John 19, chapter 19, and verse 1. Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. He whipped him. And the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe. 
mocking him, right? Purple was the color of royalty. Verse 3, and said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they smote him with their hands. Boy, I wouldn't want to be one of these soldiers. Oh, boy. Pilate therefore went forth again and saith unto him, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that ye may know that I find no fault in him. So Pilate brings him before the you-know-whos and says, I don't find anything wrong with this guy. Five. Then came Jesus forth wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate saith unto them, Behold the man. When the chief priests thereof and the officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate saith unto them, Take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was the more afraid. Now let me tell you something, people. When Jesus is drawing crowds of thousands of people, you better believe that Pilate had spies following Jesus around to report on what he was doing and what he was teaching. Because his rulership is in danger. So he wants to know, what is Jesus teaching? Is he teaching rebellion against Rome? Or is he teaching the gospel and the kingdom of God? And you think Pilate's people didn't watch the miracles? Jesus healing people? Things that are absolutely impossible? Pilate, you, I guarantee you, Pilate knew all these things. You know, you can't be a ruler of an area and not know what's going on around your area of responsibility. He had to have had spies. Now, is this in the Bible? No. But I guarantee you, he knew the miracles that Jesus was doing. That's why he was afraid. He knew that he was crucifying, being called upon to crucify an, uh, an innocent man. That's why he washed his hands and he said, his blood be upon, uh, I am innocent of the blood of this innocent man. And then if you listen to all the 501c3 tax-exempt corporate church businesses chartered by the state, they'll always tell you, oh yeah, it was Pilate. Pilate killed Jesus. No, no, no. My King James that I trust tells you who killed Jesus. We have a law, and by our law he ought to die because he made himself the Son of God. Then Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was the more afraid. And he went again into the judgment hall and saith unto Jesus, Whence art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then said Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee, and have power to release thee? Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. Those that delivered Jesus to Pilate have the greater sin. Do you know there is a sin and then there's a greater sin? I've had stupid Baptists tell me, oh, all sin's the same. No, it's not. Not if you believe Jesus, but they really don't believe the King James Bible because they got dispensational theology. And depending upon where they read something in the Bible, oh, well, that doesn't apply to us. We're the, we're the New Testament church age. So that doesn't apply to us. They explain it away. And they're the ones that are supporting 
the orange man. They think he's going to be so much better than the other one. Boy, I'll tell you what. I'm actually, I don't know. I'm kind of looking forward to the day when they get their heads in a guillotine and they're told, deny Jesus or die. But but we always supported you, you, uh, you chosen people. Yes, we know. Thank you very much, chop. I don't know. You know, these are the people that would never bother to read the Bible. Oh, yeah, I read John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And that's the extent of their Bible knowledge. Thou couldest have no power at all against, against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. People, all, everything that's going on in this world right now is under God's control. The West, the Christian, formerly Christian nations and people have rejected virtually everything good in the Bible and abandoned this world to the devil and his children and his angels. And yes, the devils have children. Absolutely. And I'm not talking spiritual children. Verse 12. And from thenceforth, Pilate sought to release him. Who's him? Jesus. Pilate wanted to release Jesus. But the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. You let Jesus go, we're going to charge you before Caesar for sedition and treason. Verse 13. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement. But in the Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now, why would they say, but in the Hebrew, Gabbatha? Because this was probably written in Greek. I've had people tell me, oh, the New Testament, more specifically, the book of Matthew was originally Hebrew, but then it was mistranslated by those anti-Semitic Greeks. No. That's why it tells you it's called the pavement, but in the Hebrew, Gabbatha. Because if it was translated from Hebrew into Greek, this phrase wouldn't even be in there. It wouldn't have to be. But in the Hebrew, Gabbatha. Verse 14. And it was the preparation of the Passover and about the sixth hour. And he, Pilate, saith unto the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, And these are not Catholic priests. We have no king but Caesar. Boy, they're liars, huh? Then delivered he him therefore unto them to be crucified, and they took Jesus and led him away. And he, bearing his cross, went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew, Golgotha. See, it was Greek, but then it tells you in the Hebrew, it's Golgotha. See, the Bible makes sense when you let it. You see why they hate the King James Bible? The King James Bible explains the King James Bible. The modern Bibles don't do this. And when I hear people say, oh, well, King James Bible's got thousands of errors, I, I know that they are either deceived or they're deceivers. So, the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two other with him, 
one on either side, and Jesus in the midst. So Jesus is in the middle. You got a thief on the right and a thief on the left. And I wonder if the thief that repented was on the right. Wouldn't surprise me. Verse 19. Listen to this carefully. And Pilate wrote a title, a sign, and put it on the cross. And the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This title then read many of the Jews, for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city, and it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. Now, if you wanted to be a scholar in the Levitical religion, you had to know Hebrew. Greek was the language of the area for over 300 years before Christ was even born. Alexander the Great, they call him, conquered from the border of India, Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, the land of Canaan, Palestine, all the way to Egypt, including Greece and Turkey, modern-day Turkey. You're talking a huge area. People, look at the map. I mean, and let me tell you something. When you conquer an area, the people that are subject to the conquerors are going to learn their language. The conquerors aren't going to learn your language. No, you're going to learn their language. You're going to learn the language of the guy holding the sword. I heard a, a little story. Somebody went back in time. They got built a time machine and they went back in time and they grabbed somebody from uh, New York and San Francisco from the 1890s. And they brought him to modern day New York and Los Angeles, L.A. And they let him walk around for a few hours. And then they went and grabbed him again and said, Hey, how's it going, guys? And they said, uh, When did our country get invaded? When, we were, when were we conquered? And the guy that had the time machine said, What, what are you talking about being conquered? And the, the guy from New York and Los Angeles said, We've been invaded. I mean, you got all these non-English speakers. We've been invaded. All these third world heathen aliens. We've been conquered. We've been invaded. And the guy with the time machine, oh, no, no, you got it all wrong. That's multiculturalism. Don't you understand? Multi-what? You idiot, you've been invaded. Let me tell you something. In the early 1960s, I was in elementary school in Miami. Class was almost all white. Spoke English. Everything was safe. Used to walk to school. Never had to worry about nothing. Schools were safe. No school shootings. None of that stuff. By the late 70s, when you looked in the newspaper for a job, must be bilingual, must be bilingual, must be bilingual, must speak Spanish. I went to Sears and Kmart. The clerks refused to speak English to me. In the 80s, I got a traffic ticket from a Hispanic cop. Said I ran a red light, I mean a, a stop sign. No, I didn't. But he gave me a ticket anyways. I went to go pay it at the, uh, the, the, the ticket at the uh, ticket counter in Miami. Not one clerk would speak English to me. They refused. We've been invaded, people. Invaded. 
when your when your country is taken over, you're going to learn the language of the conquerors. They knew Greek. Look up Constantinople. Turkey used to be called Greece. Constantinople is today called Istanbul. Uh, they don't speak Greek anymore. They speak uh, the Turkish language because they were conquered by the Ottoman Turks, a group of Muslims. That's how it works. Greek was the common language in the time of Jesus. The title, this title then read many of the Jews for the place where Jesus was crucified was night of the city and it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. Latin was the official language of the Roman Empire. I will guarantee you Pilate knew Latin. He was the administrator. But I'm I'm relatively positive that Jesus and Pilate conversed to each other in Greek. I you you really everybody says, "Oh, well, Jesus was a Hebrew, so he spoke Hebrew." He probably did. I'm sure he did. But do you think he was speaking Hebrew to Pilate? No. No. Greek, in all likelihood. Paul. Paul was a Roman citizen. You think he knew Latin? Uh, if you're a citizen of a country, aren't you going to know the language of that country, the official language? Absolutely. When Paul studied at the feet of Gamaliel, a a learned rabbi. You think he learned Hebrew, reading the ancient scriptures? Of course he did. When Paul went to Greece, Thessalonica, and Colossae, and uh, Ephesus, you know, Ephesians, Colossians, Thessalonians, what language do you think he's taught them in? Oh, well, you probably Hebrew. No. He spoke to the Greeks in their language, Greek. That's how it works. And the title, it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. Then said the chief priests of the Jews to Pilate, Write not the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. He's kind of rubbing their nose in it when you think about it. So, all right, let's keep looking at some things. So, tongues was languages, people. It's not gibberish. That's the problem. Somebody came to my uh, YouTube channel and said, oh, yeah, Paul, Paul created the Pentecostal church where they're speaking gibberish. Because just because they call it the same thing Paul called it, tongues, it's not the same thing. All right? In the 1920s, if, if you said, uh, oh, yeah, my girlfriend is gay, well, that means she was happy, fun-loving. Doesn't mean she was a lesbo. No. That's the modern-day thing. You know, words, meanings change. In 1 Corinthians, Corinthian, uh, the Corinthians were a city in Corinth, in Greece. 1 Corinthians 14, 18. I thank my God I speak with tongues more than ye all. Like I said, Paul was a Roman citizen. Did he know Latin? Probably. He definitely knows Greek because all his letters were written in Greek. And he studied at the feet of Gamaliel, a rabbi, Paul was a learned scholar. You better believe he knew Hebrew. So he knew tongues. He knew three languages. Now, concerning uh, speaking in tongues, in 1 Corinthians 14, 5, I would that y'all spake with tongues, 
but rather that ye prophesied. For greater is he that prophesied than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret, that the church may receive edifying. What good is speaking gibberish or even an unknown language? All right. I don't speak Chinese. Somebody comes to the church and I'm there and they're speaking Chinese, praising God in Chinese. What good is that to me? It's worthless. So, all right, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27. Now ye are all the body of Christ and members in particular. And God hath set some in the church, first apostles. The apostles are going to be the top dogs in the kingdom. Secondarily prophets, people like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. Thirdly teachers, I pray I'm in this bunch right here around the middle. After that, miracles. Do you know a teacher is more important than a miracle worker? Huh. Then gifts of healing, helps, people that help others, governments, administrators, diversities of tongues. So first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers. What are tongues? Last. 29. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, have all the gift of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret, but covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. Tongues is the last gift, believe it or not. It's the one the uh, I would rather, I'd much rather have the gift of healing. I would much rather have that than being able to speak in an un unknown language. So, all right, let's go to the book of Acts chapter 21. Do you know when you deny Paul as an apostle, you're throwing away the book of Acts. I mean, you're telling everybody the book of Acts is wrong. Matter of fact, you're saying the second Peter is wrong too, because Peter in second Peter says Paul is a brother in Christ. Not only that, you're denying that the Holy Spirit failed to warn Peter and the rest of the apostles that Paul was a fake. And you got to throw away the book of Romans, the book of Corinthians, the book of Ephesians, the book of Colossians, Thessalonians. What do you got left when you get rid of Paul? Almost nothing. Paul wrote uh, probably a third of the New Testament. A third. You're going to throw away a third of the Bible because of some antichrist devil that you believe? Are you an idiot? Paul died for his faith. All right. Acts 21, 25. And if you don't believe Paul, don't read this because it shouldn't even be in the Bible. And you're going to tell me for almost 2,000 years the church believed Paul and all of a sudden now you're smarter than everybody for the last 2,000 years and you want to get rid of Paul? Really? That's why I don't, you know, people are telling me Paul's false. Well, the Bible says a heretic after the second or third admonition, reject. And I take that to heart. And by the way, Paul wrote that too. Acts 21, 25. Paul says, as touching the Gentiles, the nations, which believe, we have written and concluded that they observe no such thing, you know, circumcision, Sabbath keeping, all that kind of stuff. Save only that they keep them things sell, that they keep themselves from things offered to idols and from blood and from strangled and from fornication. Then Paul took the men and the next day, purifying himself with them, entered into the temple to signify 
the accomplishment of the days of purification until that an offering should be offered for every one of them. And when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews which were of Asia, when they saw him in the temple, stirred up all the people and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man that teacheth all men everywhere against the people and the law and this place, and further brought Greeks also into the temple and hath polluted this holy place. For they had seen before with him in the city uh, Trophimus, an Ephesian, a Greek, whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. And all the city was moved, and the people ran together, and they took Paul and drew him out of the temple, and forthwith the doors were shut. And as they went about to kill him, tidings came unto the chief captain of the band that all Jerusalem was in an uproar, who immediately took soldiers and centurions, a centurion is like a captain. A, cent, uh, a centurion was a captain sort of in charge of a hundred men. Uh, two centurions would make a modern day company in the army. U.S. anyways. I don't know about other countries. But in the United States, a full strength company is 200 men. So... But a centurion was half that size. Who immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran down unto them. And when they saw the chief captain and the soldiers, they left beating of Paul. Then the chief captain came near and took him and commanded him to be bound with two chains and demanded who he was and what he had done. Who are you and what did you do? 34. And some cried one thing, some another, among the multitude. And when he could not know for certainty of the tumult, he commanded him to be carried into the castle. Now, they're in the temple. What, do you, what language do you think they're speaking here to this Roman soldier, this captain? Hebrew? I don't think so. Latin? Possibly. But... Very likely Greek. Very, very likely. But I don't know, because the Bible doesn't say. So he commanded him to be carried into the castle. And when he came upon the stairs, so it was that he was born of the soldiers for the violence of the people. For the multitude of the people followed after crying, Away with him! Verse 37. And... As Paul was about to be led into the castle, he said unto the chief captain, May I speak unto thee? Who said, Canst thou speak Greek? So Paul is saying, Can I speak to you? And the captain is saying, Can you speak Greek? And the captain says, Art not thou that Egyptian, which before these days made us an uproar and let us out into the wilderness, 4,000 men that were murderers. But Paul said, I am a man which am a Jew of Tarsus, a city in Sicilia, a citizen of no mean city. And I beseech thee, suffer or allow, suffer me to speak unto the people. And when he had given him license, Paul stood on the stairs and beckoned with his hands unto the people. And when there was a great silence, he spake unto them in the Hebrew tongue. He spake unto them in the Hebrew tongue, saying, Huh. So here it is. He's speaking to them in Hebrew. The captain of the guard says, Can you speak Greek? Why would he say that? Because he probably had to speak with this guy in Greek. All right, let's go to Acts chapter 16. We're not going to read the whole thing. Uh, let's start 16 and 14. Um, and a certain woman named Lydia, 
a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized and her household, she besought us, saying, If ye have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. And it came to pass, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel, possessed with a spirit of divination, met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. Spirit of divination. You're talking a devil spirit. The 17, the same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. See, sometimes even the devils tell the truth. And this did she many days, but Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. And when her masters saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace unto the rulers and brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceeding trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, being Romans." And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrate rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, stripes that, you know, when you get beaten with a whip, it leaves a stripe on you. You'll, you'll look like a tiger by the time they're done, right? So they laid many stripes upon them. They cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. People, let me tell you something. Can you imagine today the average churchgoer getting beaten for Christ and thrown into prison? You think they're going to be singing praises to God? Most of them are going to be like, oh, God, why did you let me have it? <laughs> They'll be crying. They're not going to be praising God. They're going to, they're going to think, who knows what they're going to think. These idiots don't bother to read the Bible. People die to give us the Bible in our own language, and they won't even bother to read it. You know, I've had so many people, oh, I'm a Christian. Oh, you are? Really? That's wonderful. Name 10 books in the Bible. Uh, Genesis, Revelation, Matthew, uh, uh, I don't know. Really? You, you can't even name 10 books in the Bible, but you're a Christian. I know you haven't read them. I mean, I don't know if I could name every single one. I could name about 40 of them real pretty quick. I might have to think about the other ones, but, uh, you know, really? I mean, people are stupid. They really are. All right, so Paul and Silas are in prison, and they're singing praises to God. Verse 26, and suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison awakening out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out a sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, do, do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Why would the, why would the prison keeper uh, want to kill himself? Because when you were in charge of the prison... And you let the prisoners escape? Let me tell you something. The, the Roman government, they would torture you. Before, they would torture you until you were dead. Trust me, I, I think I would rather die quick death than to be tortured to, unto death. But hey, that's just me. Do thyself no harm, for we all for we are all here. 
Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. And he took them that same hour of the night, and washed their stripes, and was baptized, he and all his straightway. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. And when it was day, the magistrate sent the sergeant, saying, Let those men go. And the keeper of the prison told this, saying to Paul, The magistrates have sent to let you go. Now therefore, depart and go in peace. But Paul said unto them, They have beaten us openly uncondemned, being Romans, and have cast us into prison? And now do they thrust us out privily, you know, privately? They beat us openly, but now they want us to leave quietly? Nay, verily, but let them come themselves and fetch us out. And the sergeants told these words unto the magistrates, and they feared when they heard that they were Romans. Let me tell you something. When you're a Roman citizen... Uh, they had certain rights, just like uh, being a U.S. citizen used to have. We don't have any rights anymore. We really don't. Constitution is just a piece of paper that they hold up to make you think that you still live under it, but you don't. And the sergeants told these words unto the magistrates, and they feared when they heard that they were Romans. Because Paul could have ch charged, uh, told Caesar that these magistrates had beaten them for nothing and they would have gotten in trouble. And what language do you think they, uh, Paul was speaking to these Romans with? Probably Latin. And they came and besought them and brought them out and desired them to depart out of the city. And they went out of the prison and entered in the house of Lydia, where they had seen the brethren. They comforted them and departed. Boom, there you go. I mean, you know, if you're talking to Roman soldiers, what language do you think they're going to speak? Oh, they're going to speak Hebrew. I don't think so. So, oh boy. So here in Acts 22, um, Paul is, he is uh, a little background. He's having problems here and he's wants to talk to his people and tell them what's going on. Because remember, Paul was uh, persecuting the church, but now he is preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, well, maybe maybe I'll take a look at 21. All right, Acts 21. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, we read Acts 21 where he was in the temple and they were beating him and the Roman soldiers came. I should have done this before, but I didn't. All right, Acts 22. Men, brethren, and fathers, hear ye my defense, which I make now unto you. And when they heard that he spake in the Hebrew tongue to them, they kept the more silence. And he saith, I am verily a man, which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, a city in Sicilia, yet brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel. Gamaliel was a very learned rabbi, highly respected. Matter of fact, I've read some of his writings in times past. And he's mentioned elsewhere in the book of Acts. Uh, they were going to kill Peter in the temple. And Gamaliel said, basically, if these men are of God, you cannot overthrow it. But if they're not of God, everything they do will come to naught, nothing. So he gave them counsel. 
Maybe I'll... Maybe I'll read that real quick. All right, let's go to Acts chapter 5 real quick and read about Gamaliel. Verse 12. And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders, miracles, wrought among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. So they're by the temple. Solomon's porch is the porch in the temple, by the temple. And of the rest durst no man join himself to them, but the people magnified them. And believers were the more added to the Lord, multitudes both of men and women, insomuch that they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. Then came also a multitude out of the cities round about Jerusalem, bringing sick folks and them which were vexed with unclean spirits, and they healed every one. You know, I've asked for the gift of healing, and so far the Lord is always no. So, boy, I would love to go to a children's hospital and clean that place out. But, uh, yeah, the devils would not like that. Then the high priest rose up, and all that were with him, which is of the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation. That's extreme hatred. Now, the Sadducees are different from the Pharisees. The, Pharise uh, the Sadducees believed in the first five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Leviticus was the book for the Levite priests. They were the ones that did the temple sacrifices. They did not believe anything outside those five books. They said the books of Moses are inspired. Everything else we're not sure about. Whereas the Pharisees sort of kind of believe it, believed what they call the, uh, the Tanakh, which is the Torah, which is the books of Moses, the first five, first five books, plus the writings, the Psalms, the major prophets, the minor prophets. They believe kind of all that. But they also believed the what they call the Talmud, which means learning, which came from Babylon, the Babylonian Talmud. Learning from Babylon, right? That's exactly what it means. Which is the uh, what Jesus condemned is called the tradition of the elders. See, they believed in tradition over and above the opinions of men over and above the word of God. So, so the high priest rose up and uh, they were filled with indignation. Verse 18, and they laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. But... The angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, Go, stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. So, and when they heard that, they entered into the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest came, and they that were with him, and called the council together and all the senate of the children of Israel, and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came and found them not in the prison, they returned and told, saying, The prison truly found we shut with all safety, and the keepers standing without before the doors. But when we had opened, we found no man within. Now when the high priest and the captain of the temple and the chief priest heard these things, they doubted of them whereunto this would grow. Hey, what in the world's going on here? We got these guys locked up in prison. The prison doors are locked. The, the keepers of the prison are, the guards at the, the doors are there. But Peter's not there. Where, what's going on here? Verse 25. Then, then came one and told them, saying, Behold, the men whom ye put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then went the captain with the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared the people lest they should have been stoned. Oh, yeah. And when they brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did, we, did not we straightly command you that ye should not teach in this name? And behold, 
Ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Well, I say if the shoe fits, wear it. That's right, because you guys killed him, not Pilate. Pilate didn't kill Jesus. You guys did. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye, not the Romans, they're in the temple talking to the uh, chief priests, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witness of these things, and so is the Holy Ghost whom God hath given to them that obey him. When they heard that, they were cut to the heart and took counsel to slay them. So here it is. It's not enough that they already killed Jesus. Now they're wanting to kill Peter. Verse 34. Then stood there up one in the council, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a doctor of the law. To be a doctor of the law is many, many, many years of study. Gamaliel, a doctor of the law, had in reputation among all the people. So he was respected. He was, Gamaliel was highly, highly respected and commanded to put the apostles forth a little space, and said unto them, Gamaliel speaking here, Ye men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what ye intend to do as touching these men. For before these days rose up Thutis, boasting himself to be somebody to whom a number of men, about 400, joined themselves, who was slain, and all, and as many as obeyed him, were scattered and brought to naught, to nothing. After this man rose up Judas of Galilee in the days of the taxing and drew away much people after him, he also perished, and all, even as many as obeyed him, were dispersed. Now I And now I say unto you, refrain from these men and let them alone. For if this counsel or this work be of men, it will come to naught. It'll come to nothing. But if it be of God... Ye cannot overthrow it, lest haply ye be found even to fight against God. Now that's some good advice there. If this, if what these guys are doing are of God, not only can you, you can't stop it, but you're going to be fighting against God himself. Verse 40, and to him they agreed, and, with the, and when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Oh, no, we don't teach that anymore. No, we teach the pre-trib rapture. You're not going to ever have to suffer for Christ. You're going to fly away. We we're going to fly away. Wow. They rejoice that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. What name is that? It's not Yeshua. The name is Jesus. Verse 42, And daily in the temple and in every house they cease not to teach and preach Jesus. That's what we ought to be doing, preaching and teaching Jesus. All right, so Paul was captured in Acts 21. They were getting ready to kill him. The Roman soldiers and centurions came and and kept Paul from being killed. And now Paul is going to speak in his defense in the temple. Men, brethren, and fathers, hear ye my defense, which I make now unto you. And when they heard that he spake in the Hebrew tongue, he spake in the Hebrew tongue to them. They kept the more silence, and he saith. So Paul went to Greece Greek cities, he spoke to them in Greek. He was a Roman citizen. He knew Latin, I'm sure. And here he is speaking to them in Hebrew tongue. Three languages, tongues. Paul says he speaks with tongues more than all of them. 
when you go to Europe, somebody that speaks only one language is considered illiterate. The average European knows two or three languages. Do you know the official language of Switzerland? Well, that's, that's a trick question. Because Switzerland has three official languages. Italian, French, and German. Because they border France, Italy, and Austria. And Austria speaks German. Aust Switzerland has three official languages. And that's normal. That's a normal thing in Europe. Because everybody speaks a different language. Tower of Babel, right? And when they heard that he spake in the Hebrew tongue to them, they kept the more silence, and he saith, I am verily a man, which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, a city in Sicilia, yet brought up in this city, Jerusalem, at the feet of Gamaliel, and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers, and was zealous towards God, as ye all are this day. And I persecuted this way unto the death, what way? The way of Christ. And I persecuted this way unto the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women, as also the high priest doth bear me witness, and all the estate of the elders, from whom also I received letters unto the brethren, and went to Damascus to bring them which were there bound unto Jerusalem for to be punished. Uh, and if you say Paul is a false apostle, you're saying that this whole story is garbage, trash. That you're right, and every Christian that believed this for the last almost 2,000 years is wrong. This is the idiocy that is coming out of the so-called church world today, out of the mouth of wolves. So Paul's on his way to Damascus, verse 6, Acts 22, 6. And it came to pass that as I made my journey and was nigh unto Damascus about noon, noon, it's bright, suddenly there shone from heaven a great light round about me. Now, here it is, it's noon, full sun, and there's a great light shining from heaven down to him. I mean, he must have been shining bright. And I fell unto the ground and heard a voice saying unto me, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Now, why would Paul, who was persecuting the church, lie about this? So he could be beaten, thrown in prison, be murdered for Jesus? Oh, but he's a false apostle. I mean, what kind of idiots believe this stuff? Really? Just like the apostles, they all said that Jesus was resurrected from the dead. Why? So they could be beaten and murdered? Would you die for a lie that you knew was a lie? That you made up to deceive people with? All right, come on, this is, that's the kind of stupidity that's going through these people's minds. And this kind of thinking is what they call apologetics. In the Greek, uh, it doesn't mean apologizing for being, being wrong. No, 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 no. Apologetics, uh, I think it's apologia. It's a Greek word. It means to give an answer. Uh, I forget who said it, but somebody said, always be ready to give an answer to those for the hope that is within you. What hope? The hope of eternal life, the forgiveness of sins, uh, that kind of hope, the hope that's within us. The hope to get out of this evil, wicked world and it's, I can't even imagine, I can't even describe it. It's just evil. I hate this world. I used to have joy in this world. I don't anymore. And I fell unto the ground and heard a voice saying unto me, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And I answered, who art thou, Lord? And he said unto me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. And they that were with me and saw indeed the light and were afraid, but they heard not the voice of him that spake with me. Where are these guys that were with Paul? 
Where are they? I mean, I'd be like, whoa, dude, what's going on? Seeing a light from heaven that's blinding in the noontime? And it's only on Paul? And I said, what shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said unto me, arise, go into Damascus, and there it shall be told thee of all these things which are appointed for thee to do. And when I came, I could not see for the glory of that light, being led by the hand of them that were with me, I came into Damascus. Whoa. Paul was blinded by the light. Uh, who was that? Manfred Mann. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, God, I'm old. Uh, that was a 70s song, people. Blinded by the light. Man, Manfred Mann. I don't think they were talking about Paul here, but yeah. All right, verse 12. And one Ananias, a devout man, according to the law, having a good report of all the Jews which dwelt there, came unto me and stood and said unto me, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. And the same hour I looked up upon him. Uh, you see, Ananias, in another part of the book of Acts, was told to uh, go to Saul and to help him restore his sight. All right, so, um, all right, so Ananias came unto me and stood and said unto me, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. And the same hour I looked up upon him. And he said, The God of our fathers hath chosen thee, that thou shouldest know his will and see that just one, and shouldest hear the voice of his mouth. For thou shalt be his witness unto all men of what thou hast seen and heard. And now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Wow. And it came to pass that when I came again to Jerusalem, even while I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance, and saw him saying unto me, Make haste, and get thee quickly out of Jerusalem, for they will not receive thy testimony concerning me. And I said, Lord, they know that I imprisoned and beat in every synagogue them that believed on thee. And when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by and consenting unto his death and kept the raiment of them that slew him. And he said unto me, Depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles or nations. Now, here's the funny thing. Peter was a fisherman, unlearned, you know, rough talking probably. He was sent to Judah and Jerusalem. Paul was a learned scholar of the Hebrews. And where did he go? He went to the Greeks. Tell me God doesn't have a sense of humor. You know, if it was me, I would say, oh yeah, send Paul to the to Jerusalem and Peter to the Greeks. No, he did the opposite. <laughs> so I, you know, it just, sometimes the Lord just throws a monkey wrench in things, I guess you could say, in a sense, you know. God doesn't need a monkey wrench. So, verse 22. And they gave him audience unto his word, and then lifted up their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for it is not fit that he should live. So here it is. These people, they don't want to hear about Jesus. They don't want to hear about it. And as they cried out and cast off their ho clothes and threw dust in the air, the chief captain, the Roman, commanded him to be brought into the castle and bade that he should be examined by scourging and that he might know wherefore they cried so against him. Well, yeah, he's speaking to them in Hebrew, and this captain probably knows Latin, he probably knows Greek, but he doesn't know what this guy, what Paul's saying, and why these guys, the people in the temple are throwing dust in the air, and they're all agitated and ready to kill Paul. So he's going to take a whip and beat it out of him. What What's going on here? Why are you... So hated. And as they bound him, Paul, with thongs, 
Paul said unto the centurion that stood by, probably in Latin or Greek, Is it lawful for you to scourge a man, to whip a man that is a Roman and uncondemned? When the centurion heard that, he went and told the chief captain, saying, Take heed what thou doest, for this man is a Roman. Then the chief captain came and said unto him, Tell me, art thou a Roman? And he said, Yea. Now let me tell you something. If Paul was speaking perfect Latin here, you better believe that he's going to believe him that he is a Roman. I mean, that's just the way it is. Are you a Roman? And he said, Yea. And the chief captain answered, with a great sum obtained I this freedom. And Paul said, But I was free born. Then straightway they departed from him, which should have examined him. And the chief captain also was afraid after he knew that he was a Roman because he had, ha he had bound him. So I think we have, uh, I think you get the idea now. Tongues were languages. Okay, for the most part. And Paul, I guarantee you, Paul spoke Greek to the Greeks. When he was in Rome, he probably spoke Latin and Greek. Paul wrote the book of Romans. Well, he, he probably preached in Latin to the Romans. But the New Testament was written in Greek because that was the common language. And yet, the Bible records that in, when he was in Jerusalem, he spoke Hebrew on, a, on occasion. I don't know how often. But Paul spoke tongues, languages. He wasn't in a Pentecostal church speaking gibberish. So, why was... The New Testament written in Greek and not Hebrew. Well, the answer to that is in Matthew 21, 43. Jesus speaking to the Jews. Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. What nation was that? The Greeks. The Greeks gave us the Greek Bible. In, uh, that was translated into English. Who it was that was killing Christ and the Christians and the prophets? Not the Greeks. Not the Greeks. And let me tell you something. And I've covered this in other store, uh, teachings. When the Assyrian Empire took northern Israel into captivity, and then they collapsed, when uh, Babylon took over, the Israelites fled. Where did they go? Europe and Greece. There were Israelites in Greece. How do I know that? You want to know why they hate Paul and they want you to believe Paul's a false apostle? Corinthians, Corinth, a city in Greece. The book of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant, a lack of knowledge, how that all our fathers, the Hebrews, were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. What cloud? There was a cloud that led the Israelites in the book of Exodus out of Egypt and all passed through the sea. What sea? The Red Sea. Verse 2, and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did all eat the same spiritual meat. What meat? What spiritual meat? Manna from heaven. Paul is telling the Corinthians that they were Hebrews. Do you get it yet? Read, read Jeremiah 3 and verse 8, where God divorced Israel. And then Jeremiah 31, 31, where he says he's going to remarry Israel. 
and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual rock. I'm sorry, the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. But with many of them, God was not pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. The cloud. There was a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. In Exodus 13, 21, And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them by the way, to lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. Nehemiah 9, 19, Yet thou in thy manifold mercies forsookest them not in the wilderness, the pillar of the cloud, departed not from them by day to lead them in the way, neither the pillar of fire by night to show them light, and the way wherein they should go. Uh, remember, Moses struck the rock and it gave him water in the desert, and that rock was Christ. Christ is the chief cornerstone, people, of our faith. He's not the capstone. That's a pyramid thing. The all-seeing eye. No. That's a different. That's somebody different. They were baptized in the sea. What sea? They crossed the Red Sea into Moses. Remember Moses touched the Red Sea with the, his rod and the waters parted and they crossed across on dry land? Oh, what are you talking about, Bob? What? You've never read that? My... My Lord, you've never read that? I strongly recommend you open up the book of the King James Bible, Genesis 1-1. And when you get through Genesis, you read Exodus, and there you go. You'll read about them crossing the Red Sea. And that's what Paul was talking about in the book of Corinthians. And the uh, spiritual meat, the manna. Actually, the manna was symbolic of Christ, the bread from heaven coming down. Read the book of John, chapter 6. Christ was the bread that came down from heaven. So, I mean, the whole Bible just ties into each other. It really does. Wow, I thought this was going to be a short study, and it's already an hour and 20, over almost an hour and a half. Wow. Wow. All right, well, uh, I think we ought to cut this short. But let me give you a little piece of advice. If you read three chapters of the Bible every single day, without fail, in one year you will have read the entire Bible. You can always get the Alexander Scorby King James Bible on audio. Stick it in the car on the way to work every day. I don't know about you, but when I was going to work, um, I could listen for half an hour every day. Yeah. I remember buying it in a truck stop in Louisiana. It was a cassette back then in the 90s. I went through the whole Bible in about six days. Not quite seven. Uh, from Genesis all the way to Revelation. Of course, I was listening to it. 12 to 15 hours a day, maybe more, I don't know. But uh, yeah, you'd be amazed what you could learn and how quickly. So, all right, all blessings, praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' precious name. Amen.